morning. This is the Vermont House uh, Transportation Committee. Uh, we're having a, a short hearing. Might be might be shorter than our scheduled hour and a half. Um, but knowing us, it won't be. But it could be. <laughs> um, and we're just uh, taking up uh, these three uh, sunsets that are in the law. That um, uh, the question being: Should they be the sunset? Should it go on longer? Should it be removed altogether? Um, and that's usually what sunsets are for, to have a, another look. And so we're going to take that look at those three uh, today. Um, we could talk about some of the things, but um, it, we're not going to work on a T-bill until next week. And that's when the agency uh, is hoping to uh, be prepared to uh, give us their proposal for a, um, uh, we could call it a COVID-19 T-bill. And they um, and how that would change how, how they propose um, to change the uh, white book, uh, and that and that will finally be our opportunity to uh, dig into that. Um, regarding whether how, how we do that logistically, should we take that bill back into our committee? Um, the speaker did not see the sense in that because she because it would take uh, there are some. Procedural things that have to happen um, have to happen to make to make that happen, uh, you know, floor action, and um, as you can see from yesterday, uh, trying to minimize the um, what actually has to happen on the floor, which is why we're seeing uh, Senate bill amendments uh, uh, from from the House uh, being presented uh, as opposed to committee bills and other ways of doing it that they would just take more time. That was her only concern with that. Um, yeah, I don't know that it that it matters. Um, we will, we obviously will not be passing uh, or presenting the bill that we passed uh, on on uh, Friday the thirteenth, Friday March thirteenth. Um, it's going to be diff uh, quite different, and um, uh, how we do that, um, I don't know. You know if, if it really matters, but. Speaker did not think it was a good idea to for us to um, bring it back into committee, which people asked me about uh, last time we met. Okay, so um, also, do we have Anthea and um, and Neil on? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here too. Oh, good, very good. Um, all right, uh, Anthea, why don't we start with you to go over these um, sunsets again? Okay. Ask again because. As I mentioned in the email, um, we did have a, uh, it was a Zoom meeting between Lori, Anthea, Neil, Barbara, and me uh, to talk about uh, these sunsets. And, um, and now the whole committee will hear about them and decide what we want to do with them. Anthea. Okay, so for the record, Anthea Dexter Cooper, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, Lori, can you make it so that I can share my screen? You are now co-host. Thank you. Okay, so the first thing that I thought might make sense is, um, you know, if not everyone is up to speed on what we mean when we say a sunset, is to show an example of a sunset that you put in the T-bill last year. So I have up the T-bill from 2019 and section 38 has language that says, 32 VSA section 604, that was what gave the administration the ability to set the fees for electric vehicle supply equipment, the electric vehicle charger, charging stations. And then this is the part that's a sunset, is repealed on July 1, 2022. So we are dealing with three instances where in session law, in sessions past, language like section 38 was included. So a statute was enacted, it was put into codified law, but then there was language saying this statute will go away, it will be repealed at a time certain in the future. And reasons to put a sunset in are you really do want it to go away, it's only intended to last for a particular period of time. Maybe you're not quite sure you actually think that should be a law and you need some time to sort of try it out and you want to force the General Assembly to look at it at some point in the future. 
or it's something that is um, kind of meant to be short lived, but you know, you want to have to take a look at it in subsequent years. Um, so that's why we have sunsets. Um, there are three statutes or pairs of statutes. There are two that I'm going to talk about together um, that are set to sunset on July 1 of 2020, which is why they're coming up now. Um, and then I think what makes sense is for me to just talk a little bit about each one. Um, there are um, definitely people um, on this committee who know more about some of them, and there are people that are um, slated to testify. So um, I think probably from the what these statutes are actually um, doing in practice, um, you, you have plenty of people to speak to. And Anthea, I yeah. would also add to your um, reasons <clears throat> why a, um, a sunset might be put into the uh, a bill and into the law uh, is because sometimes some, some people don't like what that law is at all. <laughs> and so it's a compromise with them saying, well, how about if we try it for one year or two years? And I think that might be the case with at least one of these. That is a, a good point. Yeah. Okay, so the first batch of sunsets we're gonna talk about has to do with automated license plate recognition systems. This is 23 VSA section 1607 and 1608. Um, these are the cameras that will uh, register license plates and then convert them to data that can be used. In this statute, there is a difference between active data and historic data. And there's a difference in how these ALPRs are actually used in the Department of Motor Vehicles. And I'm getting all of this background information from a report. This is at the, the very bottom of the statute in um, subsection E1, where um, every year the Department of Public Service needs to give the General Assembly a report on the usage of ALPR systems in Vermont. And according to that last report, the bulk of the ALPR usage is by the Department of Motor Vehicles, but they only use it in a read mode. They don't actually send any data to the statewide database. And there was only one other ALPR system at the end of 2019 that was actually recording data and sending it to the database to be preserved as historic data. Their data is kept for 18 months. Um, and there is um, a process whereby law enforcement can gain access to that data. You have, um, and this is in the email that Representative McCormick forwarded to all of you, the Department of Motor Vehicles position on this, and they are supporting extending this sunset out an additional two years. That would be very consistent with what has happened in past legislative sessions. So this is Act 175 from 2018. And you'll see in section one, extension of sunset. This is extending out the sunset of 1607 and 1608, an additional two years from 2018 to 2020. And you'll see in the beginning part of section one, where it says extension of sunset, and it's listing out statutes going, or uh, session law going all the way back to 2013. This, um, these two sections were added to codified law in 2013, Acts and Resolves number 69. And then it has been amended several times to push out that sunset. So what has been the General Assembly's practice in the past has been to um, extend this in one or two year increments which is what put it to a repeal of July 1, 2020. How many times did the legislature do that? Um, one, two, three. This would be the fourth time. Okay. I know that I saw a hand go up. There was a, a pop oh, I'm, up. I'm, I was, <laughs> after yesterday, I wasn't in charge of that, okay. Um, Mike McCarthy. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. So, Anthea, the repeal would basically take us back to before 2013 when there wasn't really any restriction on law enforcement storing LPR data. Is that correct? That is correct. So it would be unregulated. 
Yeah, we should definitely do this extension for two years. So the original bill is that one that Jim McCullough uh, interrogated me for like 40 minutes on the floor, thinking that we were giving police more authority when we actually were putting some boundaries on them uh, back when I was a freshman the first time around. So uh, this is very familiar territory for me. Oh, good. Thank you, President Pro Tem McCarthy. <laughs> were, there, were there other hands? And uh, okay. um, just to, to jump in, that's yeah. a really good point. Repeal means it, it goes away. It's taken out of our statutes. It's like taking a great big pen and crossing out these two um, sections of codified law. Yeah, that's what would happen if we do nothing. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so really the options are do nothing, it goes away and do something and it stays in some capacity. And could be as simple as you just push it out a couple years. It could be as complex as you push it out for a different amount of time and you change the statute somehow. And that's what actually happened in 2018 with this act that I have up. You'll see that section one is extending the sunset, but then section two is requiring the auditor to do an additional report. And then section three is actually amending one of the statutes in uh, section 1607E is amended to read. So, you know, there are iterations of we just push out the law exactly as it is to we extend the sunset, but we also change the law that we are looking at and deciding whether or not we want to keep in codified law. Okay. Um, why don't we have you go through all three of them, Anthea, and then we'll see if the if DMV would like to testify on. Sure. Okay. Yep. okay, so the next one deals with transportation network companies. And there is in 23 VSA section 754, and I should start transportation network companies are uh, companies like Uber or Lyft, where they're a vehicle for hire but it's done through uh, a means of technology and that is defined in chapter 10 in title 23. This language, all of this chapter was added in uh, 2018. And I do not think that this was something that um, the transportation committees worked on. I think this was more a, a commerce and economic development um, bill. One of the things that was included in it was a preemption clause and a savings clause. So the preemption clause is in section 754, subsection A, and it says that municipal ordinances, resolutions, or bylaws regulating transportation network companies are preempted to the extent they are inconsistent with the provisions of this chapter. So it says municipal law does not get to exist if it is inconsistent with this chapter. So just like federal law can preempt state law, we're saying state law preempts municipal law, even though one of the powers that's given to municipalities is the power to regulate vehicles for hire. Subsection B is a savings clause, which is what is set to sunset. And it says that a municipal ordinance, resolution, or bylaw regulating transportation network companies that's been adopted by a municipality with a population of more than 35,000 residents, and I think that's just Burlington, based on the 2010 census and in effect on July 1, 2017. So the ordinance needed to be in effect by July 1, 2017, and it needs to have a population above 35,000 residents. So I think this is just directed at Burlington, that subsection A, the preemption of those laws does not apply, but it's repealed on July 1, 2020. So what would happen if you do nothing is subsection B goes away, and then all municipal ordinances without regard to whether or not they were in effect on July 1, 2017, and without regard to the size of the municipality would be preempted if they're inconsistent with this chapter of state law. If you extend this, then the municipalities, we think it's just Burlington, would be able to continue regulating transportation network companies in a way that is inconsistent with state law. Uh, Anthea, what what do we have in state law for TNC besides 
what you've just told us, in other words, besides the um, the preemption and besides the um, that no town can do it unless they have 35,000 or more. So the laws for transportation companies mostly deal with background checks and insurance requirements. So I think my screen is still being shared. I've put you back to what all of chapter 10 is, and now I'm gonna show you the full text of the chapter. So it has a definition section, getting you what is a TNC, what is a prearranged fare. Um, it provides what um, the financial responsibility is going to be, the amount of insurance that needs to exist, and it's sort of divided up into these three tiers, depending on when the driver is going out to get a fare, when they actually have the um, passenger in the vehicle, and when they're just driving around waiting for someone to, to request their services. Um, there is also... Um, language about how they need to carry proof of coverage, what happens if they don't maintain insurance. There's also language on um, the background checks and what the transportation network companies which do the background checks for their drivers needs to be included in the background check. What would be um, a disqualification um, in terms of past uh, criminal history. Um, a list of crime defined in 13 BSA, section 5301, they go down, comparable offenses, felonies, um, a whole host of things that would disqual disqualify someone from being a driver. Um, it requires the commissioner of motor vehicles or designee to not more frequently than once per year do sort of an audit of background checks that are done by the transportation network company itself. I believe there's language in here that says that these are not then public records. Um, talks about enforcement um, and what the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles can do in terms of administrative penalties if the TNC violates the sections. And then we've got our preemption savings clause. Okay. And this is uh, in Title 23, right? It is. Okay. All right. Uh, other questions on this one? For Anthea. Okay. I have a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, Dave. Yeah. Uh, for Anthea, what? Why would we want to take Burlington off the hook for these regulations that are in existence for every other city in Vermont? So you wouldn't be taking Burlington. <coughs> you would be maintaining the status quo, which is that Burlington can regulate transportation network companies in a way that is inconsistent with these statutes. So for example, um, and a lot of this, I, I should explain that um, I used to sort of handle vehicle for hire matters and transportation <coughs> companies um, for the city of Burlington when I was there. So some of my information might be stale. Um, I did testify on um, the bill that put this into codified law when I worked for the city of Burlington. At that time, I believe, and I'm just using this as a description, <laughs> the city of Burlington required that drivers be 21. And I think this requires that drivers be 18. So that's an example where it's inconsistent and you're letting the city of Burlington regulate TNCs in a different way. They might have different um, convictions that would be a disqualification that are not included in the background check language in this language. Also, the city of Burlington had their vehicle for hire ordinance before, um, that dealt with transportation network companies before um, this state law was enacted. And it was something that the city was pushing for in terms of wanting to continue to regulate it as they had been doing, which involved, and I'm just, this is an example from a few years ago. And if you wanna know about what the city is doing now, you should hear from the city. Um, did these audits twice a year as opposed to once a year. So differences between um, the law um, that was on a municipal level and what was put into effect on a state level. Okay, Dave. I, I think he's still talking and is muted. Dave, have you unmuted yourself? It's reassuring to me to know that uh, you feel that Burlington's ordinance is, uh, 
you know, they have to have variations to suit their situation, but you know, there's a lot in this and unless somebody is checking on Burlington to make sure they're conforming to other things within this, this uh, long uh, uh, description of what, you know, taxi services and so forth are supposed to do, uh, who's checking on them, you know? And, uh, you know, you seem to make reassure us that it's okay, but otherwise, how would we know? And see, is there any um, reporting to the legislature? For what municipalities do? No. Yeah. So we just, we just trust Burlington to, uh, to do a good job or to conform with what's here as well as also in a way that suits their needs. Well, so this is putting obligations on the TNCs and the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles in the department for how they are ensuring that there is sufficient insurance and the background checks are being conducted. This does not provide any authority to municipalities to regulate vehicles for hire, which is something that is in, I think it's in Title 24 and in a number of municipal charters that gives them the authority to regulate all vehicles for hire, which you're in, going to include, for example, a taxi cab that you could hail on the street or has a, a roof light. Um, I can pull up the city of Burlington's vehicle for hire ordinance um, if, if that would be helpful for the committee, but this is not telling municipalities what they need to do. This is telling transportation network companies what they need to do and what the Department of Motor Vehicles needs to do in terms of that regulation and that um, enforcement. Okay, I've got three hands up um, and calling in just a, a minute. Um, remember, we, I think we're gonna have the commissioner testified. So some, if, if your questions are better for her, you might wanna hold them, um, but um, I'll leave that to you. So I've got Becca, Tim and Molly and Dave, I see your hand up, is your hand up again or? It shouldn't be up, I'll okay, lower it. Okay. Yep, very good. All right, so it's Becca, Molly, and then I guess the third person lowered their hand. Becca and then Molly. Thanks, Kurt. Um, so Anthea, we had gone back and forth a little bit with this section when we talked through taxation or like a fee on um, vehicles like Uber and Lyft, those types of companies. And so just so I understand, this wouldn't be a place to have an opportunity to put forward some of those measures we talked about by letting this part sunset? All this deals with is the, all this deals with is letting the city of Burlington continue to regulate transportation network companies in a way that is inconsistent with this state law. And it could be that there are no inconsistencies at this point, but it doesn't have anything to do with a statewide taxation of transportation network companies. If you let this sunset, you could take that up now, you could take that up at a later point. If you don't let this sunset and you push it out two years, you could do the exact same okay. thing. So you don't okay. need to, how you act in this piece has no bearing on whether or not you can have a, a taxation across the board for these sorts of services. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. I was thinking like, wait, is this our chance to get in there and to do this? And it sounds like we're not missing any big opportunity. So thank you. <laughs> well, it could be a chance to make other amendments in this. Okay. I mean, I know we had talked about it and collectively we thought it was a good idea, but I do worry about trying to tack that on into this um, and having something controversial, but that's just my thought. Thank you, Anthea. Okay, Representative Burke. Uh, thank you. So I'm just wondering, um, and we probably heard testimony when we did this, that it, it's, it's mainly, it seems to me like the regulations are, are in order to you know, make sure there's insurance, make sure that they're fairly regulated. How did the towns feel about this? Are they happy about this? I wonder how the league feels about it, the towns other than Burlington. 
I don't want to speak on behalf of any of the municipalities. I can direct you to a report that the Department of Financial Regulation did where they spoke with representatives from a number of municipalities and actually inventoried the different vehicle for hire ordinances across the uh, various municipalities. Um, one thing to be clear on here is these laws that you're looking at, Chapter 10 and Title 23, just deal with transportation network companies. It is my understanding and my information is outdated that Burlington was the only municipality that was really um, regulating transportation network companies as um, something that wasn't just a cab or an, another vehicle for hire. Um, Brattleboro, for example, I think has an ordinance that deals with vehicles for hire, but doesn't necessarily treat transportation, transportation network companies, the TNCs differently. Um, so that report might be able to provide you with some information on what municipalities think of this industry in general, or you could have the, the league testify to it. And I am not in, I went back and I looked at the committee activity for um, the bills that turned into this um, law. And you'll actually see that this is from the special session. It's um, number three from the 2018 special session. I do not believe any of the bills that dealt with transportation network companies were taken up in house transportation. So it could be that this isn't something that if you're racking your brain for what happened two years ago, that you would have a memory because it wasn't something that came up in your committee two years ago. Thank Good you. I was. I was like, <laughs> I do not remember this. <laughs> okay, Molly. Okay, uh, I have a question. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Patty. Yep, uh, Representative McCoy, you're muted. I think I get that by now. Uh, Commerce dealt with this. I was on the Commerce Committee two years ago, and that's where the TN, the, this transportation network, went through Commerce. So we spent quite a bit of time on this bill and going back and forth with the Senate on it. The, the biggest thing was the insurance piece for uh, the committee to try to get that right. But um, we spent a lot of time on it, so. Uh, Patty, I have two questions for you then. Um, uh, what was the committee's thinking, Commerce Committee's thinking? Um, uh, well, why shouldn't a smaller city be able to regulate the uh, TNCs, one, and two, um, or well, maybe this, maybe this is part of the answer. Are towns satisfied that they that the state regulation is enough, and they certainly are allowed to have them? But if they wanted to do more, like apparently Burlington did and does, what about a smaller town? Why not them? Well, Burlington was the only one that had a transportation network um, system when we were dealing with this bill. That's why we allowed them to continue on what they were doing rather than change over because they they wanted to uh, keep, as um, Anthea had mentioned a couple of them, the 18 year old to, to the 21 year old driver. There were a few things they wanted to keep. So we allowed them to, to keep what they had and sunset it, you know, it seemed like a long time, but here we are. Um, the other issue is the other small communities can have them. I mean, this was just a way for, uh, instead of them rewriting the whole book, the state, got involved and said, this is what you're going to follow if you have a, you know, a, a transportation network system. So, and the league was okay with this. They didn't come in with, you know, yep. any alarm. They weren't alarmists at all with this. So they were at the table the entire time. So. Okay. Um, Tim. I guess another uh, question for you, Patty. What was the expectation of Burlington? Were they satisfied in two years that you know they could abide by what the state put forward for the rest of the towns, or was there an expectation on their part that it was going to get extended again? What I mean, what was that conversation like, if you can recall? I, I can't recall that, Tim. I don't. Yeah. I don't remember. I think it was just because, as as um, Kurt. Or Anthea said this was this came in special session because we never yeah. it never even got to the finish line during our year. So All right. okay, the third one. The third sunset. Yep, I'm just switching over share screen. 
if I repeat myself, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm being impatient. I, I'm just not sure I was heard. Because... No, that, that, that's quite all right. And it's just, um, you know, it, it takes a couple clicks. Yep. Um, I actually had thought to load up the um, statutes, which is helping. Okay, so this is in um, 23 VSA section 1222, which deals with the annual inspections of vehicles. And the only piece that is set to sunset is subsection E, which deals with US Postal Service vehicles that have been converted to be a right-hand drive vehicle, being able to pass inspection, even if the airbag in that front right-hand side compartment has been disconnected. And I know there are people on this call who can speak to this, or in this meeting, who can speak to this better than I can. So I will leave it at if you don't do anything, then this exemption for those vehicles that would fail inspection goes away. So they would fail the inspection if that front airbag has been disconnected. Or if you push it out to another two years, another four years, this would continue to exist. Or based on the recommendation of the Department of Motor Vehicles, you could make it so that there's no sunset in play at all. And this is added to codified law. It doesn't mean that you couldn't repeal it at some point in the future but there's not going to be this every two year, every four year, whatever it is, reminder to look at this again. Thank you. So the, the council yields to the postmaster general of uh, Fairfax. Otherwise, no <laughs> Fairfax. Just a clerk. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this raised concern for me and for my fellow postal people who are still there, rural carriers, use the right-hand vehicle and they have to do this um, correction of, uh, they don't get manufactured as right-hand vehicles, only one does. And it's very challenging for them to get that. And it's only one in the United States that pr produces one that is manufactured that way. So I really appreciate the agency getting behind making this um, codified law, just making sure that this exemption is, is always there. The one concern that came up from my research was that the inspection stations aren't actually aware of this exemption. So many of the carriers have been challenged in the past couple of years with um, defending it. So I just would ask that um, any action we take, hopefully to at least keep it for two more years, if not codify it, does also include making sure that the inspection stations are alerted that this exemption is there. But it sounds like you would prefer it. Uh, we just codify uh, the exemption and not have the sunset any longer. Absolutely. I, I just, they, I don't see that there's going to be a fleet of vehicles for the carriers to pick from. And this is really only applicable for the, the rural carriers is my understanding that, you know, the postal vehicles that are built are, I presume, designed this yeah. way. Yeah. But, um, Rural carriers retrofit their own vehicle and get a an expense check for the costs of using their own vehicle. Okay, thank you. It, um, oh, and I also do want to say that it's incredibly dangerous if this if they were being required to maintain the airbag with having retrofitted a, a, a steering wheel in front of it, that would be an incredibly dangerous position. And it does worry me that even just having to plug it in to get through inspection and then unplug it leaves that issue that potentially someone forgets to unplug it. And, and I just am horrified. I mean, you don't want someone having a steering wheel blown into their body, so. I, yeah, I think that would be probably a violation of federal law, the standards for airbags, you know, that are required uh, in all cars. Um, uh, Representative Burke. Thank you. I, I too would be in favor of just codifying this. Yep. It's a um, reasonable solution to a problem. And uh, I think we need to support our post office in, these, in this era. I, I'm all for the USPS. <laughs> I think it's great. And, and I know the rural carriers really, it's a, it's a hard job having to pull over and yep. go through. Rain and sleet and snow and all that. Yep. All right, um, Tim, you put your hand back down. Yep, looks like you did. 
Okay, so that was all three. Uh, do we have, um, I see, yeah, I see uh, Commissioner Manoli, you're on the air. Good morning. I'm trying to get the buttons to work here. Oh, it is working. How's everyone doing? Well, I'm doing all right. How's everybody else? Um, doing well. So um, where would you like me to start? Would you like me to just um, go through the three really briefly on our position? Yes, because you do have a position on all three, correct? Yeah. Correct. Yes, why don't, why don't you give us that position and tell us yeah. why and then- so, um, so the first one I'm gonna address is the US Postal Service Vehicle Inspection. Um, I could not offer any better testimony than your vice chair. Um, I, you know, it is clearly, um, I don't know the history why this has been extended over, you know, um, every couple of years. My understanding is I think they were hoping that there would be more manufacturers or an easier way to accommodate the need for um, the US Postal Service. And instead of continuing to extend this, we are proposing um, that you just, you codify and you make this exemption, exception for these vehicles. I don't anticipate um, in any time soon that there are going to be multiple manufacturers um, that are producing a lot of these vehicles to meet meet the needs. All right. Do you have any questions on that one of me? Nope. Okay. Um, the next one that I'm going to go to, and I apologize, I'm looking at my screen over here, so my head is turned to you. Um, the next one I'm going to testify to um, is the TNC um, language, and um, we are proposing that you could extend this um, for two years. I would say to you, you could also consider um, if you wanted to um, just codify this, I think Anthea did a great job summarizing um, this language for you. What I'd like to say, which I think may address some of Representative Potter's um, concerns, is that um, you know the financial regulation team was the lead on this, and. Um, the statute that was created really focused on definitions for insurance requirements for TNCs, what their financial responsibility is, um, driver requirement background checks that the TNC, the companies, have to ensure that are there for the safety of individuals that are using the services. And what came out of it is the Vermont Department of Motor Vehicle does an annual audit. And what that looks like is once a year, um, at a minimum, we have to look at 25 records. The TNC companies have to send us their current listing of all of their drivers with certain information. And then we do a random check and validate mm -hmm that those drivers are in compliance with the statute and that the, the, the companies are in compliance with the statute. Um, we did our first audit last year and um, I know that we did 25 and that every one of those, um, the companies and the individuals were meeting um, the statute. And um, so, that's, I'm just, this is how we manage it. This is what we're auditing, but we're looking at driver's records. We're looking at um, the um, insurance requirements and the background checks. They have to provide that. They have to provide us data that they conducted those background checks. So in regards to, um, I was not, I had just started, um, in regards to this language that is specific to municipal ordinances. Um, what I understand, um, and I think having the city, you may wanna reach out to the city of Burlington. Um, these ordinance um, are, go beyond 
some of the audit requirements. And um, I think Anthea did a, a wonderful job summarizing what she, from her previous time, what, what it, you know, what it does for them. I believe, and I, um, I'm pretty confident that Burlington would like to continue um, with having oversight on um, their ordinance and resolutions for the TNC companies. I will tell the committee um, that this is the largest area where Uber and Lyft is successful. Many of our rural areas don't even have Uber and Lyft drivers. So this is the uh, city that does have the, the majority of the, the drivers. So I think extending it, um, you know, is a positive thing. And the city of Burlington, I think also, I'm, I think reaching out to them and getting their opinion on this would be beneficial. Questions on that? Well, I, I have a question, I guess, uh, for you, Commissioner, but also uh, for Representative Burke, Cochran, uh, McCoy and Potter, people from other, uh, Savage, you probably don't have them in, um, well, and, and White River Junction, I'm thinking of the places that may have them um, that are not uh, Burlington or Chittenden County. Uh, mm -hmm. and yes, Representative uh, White also. <laughs> no, Kurt, I was making that face because I thought you were saying former members and I was like, everyone but me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, uh, so Tim, if, can, if you wanted to take an Uber um, in, at your house, someplace inside Bennington or whatever, do you, is that available? Could you, is there a way to do that? We had, i uh, trying to think, because anybody can sign up for this. I think at one time, there was an individual from the Pinal area that, you know, had an, an Uber or a Lyft, uh, but it's not prevalent. It's not, uh, well, you know, the last I checked, I, you know, I haven't uh, uh, looked uh, to see if I could get an Uber because I really don't need one. But the last time I, I talked about it with individuals from around Bennington, I think there was just one. So we don't have an influx of, uh, of them that would require, you know, the type of regulation that we're, you know, talking about up in Burlington. So it's, I would say it's pretty scarce. Becca, how about um, the Tri-City area there? We have three Uber drivers as of my last count, and they're also Lyft drivers, so they do both. And they are based out of New Hampshire. So you actually can't request okay. an Uber in White River Junction. You can request an Uber in the address across the river and then tell the Uber driver to pick you up in White River. Um, so I don't think we would have any role of regulating them since they're like based out of New Hampshire. Now, why can't you call them and say, you know, however you do it, I'm, I'm in White River Junction and I wanna to go to some other, I wanna to go to Wilder. So the app doesn't allow you to, if you put in 050 our zip code, it won't pull up any drivers. If you, why for example, well, it's how come the free drivers aren't pulled up. I have no idea what. Do the, you know why? They may be regulated um, by the business itself to stick within their state lines, depending on what yes. their abilities yeah. are. That makes a lot of sense. Because yeah, if you just put your dot. Yeah, if you put your dot over in literally the other side of the bridge, and then just text them and say, "Hey, pick me up here," they do it. But <laughs> I want to make sure it's not a state law problem. Uh, so, Commission, do you, do you know why um, that situation that that, uh, that Representative White has? Um, I, I don't. Um, again, and I want to bring you back to the language that the legislature passed is is are the um, the responsibilities of Uber and Lyft. So drivers who sign up to be an Uber or a Lyft driver or both of them, these are the expectations of Vermont law for them to meet compliance. Um, and, and so I, I think the comments that people are making um, are probably 
um, correct, you know, just being an Uber or a Lyft user, um, you know, that there may be issues in other states and um, their designated, their designated areas. Because when you sign up for Uber and Lyft, I think you identify where you're going to be serving, you know, where you're going to be driving from. So. Anthea, what do you think? Um, it could have something to do with the geofence capabilities that are embedded in the software that the TNCs use and that those drivers have said maybe there are different insurance requirements between New Hampshire and Vermont and they don't wish to be operating in Vermont. Um, so could be those drivers are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I'd be speculating, but, um, you know, it is pretty cool and, you know, I'm sure someone from Lyft or, you um, uh, Uber could speak to this about the geofencing that they use in the app. So for example, um, they can say specific things if you're trying to get a ride at the airport. Um, if you put your little pin at the airport, it'll know that you're putting your pin in sort of a special area and direct you to particular locations. Um, there's an issue up at the airport sometimes with people getting picked up or dropped off um, just off the airport property and then people walking over. So the, the geofence is trying to, um, you know, capture the patchwork of regulation that might exist from municipality to municipality or location to location or state to state. Geofence is geographic fence, like a, a border of service. Okay. Yeah, and I think that they actually have programmers who can sort of almost draw areas on maps. Yep. So for example, a driver who uh, and again, I don't know if this is still the case in Burlington, but if you need to be 21 to be a driver in Burlington and there's someone who's 18, they could theoretically be driving in the rest of the state and not be picking up and dropping off people um, in the city of Burlington. The city of Burlington also did, I don't know if they still do, collect quarters based on the um, pickup and drop off of people if it's within the city of Burlington and you can go and look on the vehicle for hire boards um, page for through the city of Burlington and see a report of how much is collected um, in fees from the different vehicle for hire companies that operate. And I believe that is all based on geofence data that the TNCs gather because they're able to, to know where people are getting picked up and dropped off. Oh, uh, thank you. Representative Murphy, uh, was your question answered that in that or it was i just was um trying to clarify in my head that the burlington um regulations are actually stricter than what the statute is and i i just think that it sounds like we had have plenty of questions and you know extending rather than maybe um codifying is a good plan waiting till we can really ask questions of a lot more witnesses and give people an opportunity to be present. But it doesn't sound, sounds like that's also maintaining a safer path for the yeah. use of the system itself. And DMV is recommending extending it two years or codifying it, but maybe this discussion has changed the commissioner's mind about the codification, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, um, we could extend it one year if we wanted to, or. Or we could. And so I, I want to, um, I just want to say to the committee, the um, uh, Title 23-754 um, and this extension is specific to the municipal ordinances. Right. Um, and if you're going to extend those or not, the remainder of the language, everything that is under here, and I give credit to the committee that, that worked on this, um, is, is putting in place requirements for background checks, requirements for insurance. So if you're going to operate as a TNC, the, these are the things that you shall do. Those shells apply to the businesses that Burlington has, the, has an additional ordinance. So um, I, they don't get to change the compliance with the existing statute. And DMV's role is to do the audit of compliance because we have insurance and we look at driver records, et cetera. So I just, um, 
So what I'm testifying on based on um, when your session had started and you all were in full activity at the state house, um, we had been contacted by the Burlington attorney wanting to know if we were going to propose or add um, that this language for the ordinance continue. And, um, and then everything, everything occurred. I just, you know, so uh, I would really, um, that, that's all that I wanna say. I think what we are doing and the audit and the compliance um, is a good process. And um, I would not be recommending any other changes at this time to the TNC language. It, it is really about, um, and what would happen if you did not extend this language um, is we would still do our audits. We would still be reaching out to the TNC companies and requiring them to give us all of their documents and we would do the audits. We have nothing to do with creating what the ordinance looks like or would we be managing the ordinances? Okay, I've got uh, Representative Savage and then Sullivan and Representative McCoy, looks like you've put your hand back down. Okay, so uh, Brian and then Mary. Hey, thank you. Um, I, um, I guess I, I just have a question for Anthea, probably would be the best one on this. Um, so Burlington, you have to be 21. Is that correct? Is that uh, to be a Lyft driver, Uber driver? Um, now, I don't know of any Lyft or Uber drivers up in my area. Uh, I'm not sure about St. Albans, but I don't think there's anybody in Swanton. Although I keep getting emails, they want me to be a driver. Uh, I just, I put those in the trash can. Um, <clears throat> but let's say that I uh, contact somebody here in town and I need a ride to the airport. Um, and uh, so they're a, a Uber or Lyft driver, but they're only 19 years old. And um, so are they able to drop me off? Because this is a gray area. The airport is actually in South Burlington, but Burlington considers it part of Burlington. <laughs> uh, so would that work? I mean, even if they were dropping me off in the middle of downtown Burlington, I, I initiated the transaction in Swanton, which is legal for them to do, but are they saying they can't go into Burlington? Um. So I don't want to speak on behalf of how the city is enforcing the vehicle for hire ordinance or how they're currently applying it to um, the airport, which they do, do regulate um, drivers up there. I can tell you that the vehicle for hire ordinance that is posted on the city of Burlington's website does still say to legally operate a vehicle for hire in the city or at the airport, each driver must, and it lists as one of those requirements, be 21 years of age or older. One of the um, things that was brought up in the report that the, DF, the DFR did, the Department of Financial Regulation did, um, which was required as part of uh, the act that added all of this language to Title 23, was to look at whether or not there should be statewide regulation of vehicle for higher drivers in general to make it so that you, for example, traditional cab driver that is 19, so setting aside the TNC piece. You, traditional cab driver in Swanton, are contacted and your um, customer wants to be driven to the airport. You're 19. Technically, you are violating the, the city's vehicle for hire ordinance. I don't know if they're enforcing that, but the city of Burlington does require for its vehicle for hire drivers that you be 21 years of age or older. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sullivan. Uh, I, my question was pretty much answered about coming in and out of Burlington, so I don't need to ask a question. Okay. Um, all right, Commissioner, was that the, no, that was, um, we haven't talked about the cameras yet. Kurt, I have one question. Yes, please. Sorry. Sorry. Um, well, if, if somebody um, asks for the ride in Swanton to go to Burlington, wouldn't that be the same as Becca's that she wants to come 
somebody come to White River Junction to bring her to New Hampshire, but the New Hampshire people have to follow the laws of New Hampshire. I don't, you know, if they're just, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Does Burlington have a say over if the ride starts in Swanton that Brian would have to call somebody that is in the Burlington network to drive to Swanton to pick him up and bring him to Burlington? So there is a law on this out of, I believe, both the city of Burlington and the city of Rutland that deals with the fact that there are drivers who wish to operate in a municipality that they're not licensed to operate in. Also the argument of I'm a driver and I'm just driving through municipality X, do I need to be licensed to drive through municipality X? One of the things um, that a TNC regulation does is if they're allowed to drive in the whole state, it minimizes the ability for municipalities to create a sort of patchwork of regulation where maybe in Swanton, if you're, and I'm just gonna use traditional cab drivers here, maybe in Swanton, you need to have a purple light on the top of your vehicle but in the city of Burlington, you need to have a green light on top of your vehicle. Are drivers gonna then need to, to, to switch lights? Um, and there are a lot of traditional cab drivers and the DFR report speaks to this, that thinks there should be sort of uniform statewide regulation um, across the board and not letting municipalities create this sort of patchwork, which speaks to the driver in Swanton, can then they, they then go drop off at the airport. The airport also has a system of um, how you're authorized to operate at the airport. And if you've not complied with that, you might not be able to pick up and drop off at the airport. Okay. No, oh, Patty, Patty, you're muted. Yep. So the case law for the driver in Swanton, can he come into Burlington or no? Um, I need to go back and review it, but I believe the holding of the case was that if you were going to be operating in the city of Burlington, you needed to be licensed to operate in the city of Burlington. So the driver, I believe he was out of Shelburne, was not allowed to go and drop someone off. I think he was dropping food off at uh, the hospital and was okay. uh, issued a ticket for that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner, uh, how about the cameras? So I, um, I would just like the committee to know that the uh, Colonel is available to answer questions too. Um, so I think Anthea did an excellent summary to the committee on the history of this language. We are recommending to extend the sunset period for this statute by two more years. Um, this is a critical tool for the DMV enforcement because we use it and it's focused on the commercial vehicle enforcement side and reading the plates and being connected and quickly to federal information. If for instance, that business or that truck is out of service in another state and they're actually driving in the state of Vermont, it gives us immediate um, immediate information. And if I, I can, um, I think Jake has implemented this program and he would probably like to add to my testimony and then both of us can answer questions. Jake, are you there? I Jake? Don't I don't see him. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Good morning. Come on, you should identify yourself, Jack. Uh, for the record, Colonel Jake Alberto with the Department of Motor Vehicles. Good morning. So uh, as the commissioner said, uh, we're still supportive of the language. Um, it's, uh, it's a very defined uh, use for us, like the commissioner said. Um, other agencies in the, in the past have used it for like NCIC, uh, stolen vehicles, uh, suspended vehicles, expired registrations, um, but right now, the only thing DMV uses, and if you look at the language, it's really provided a carve out. We use it specifically just for commercial vehicle uh, safety screening. We use a uh, federal database that is just for the, the power units or the, the tractor of a uh, commercial vehicle, the license 
as data is entered in to our LPRs and we use that to screen when we're doing truck decals. And that is the only screening we do with the uh, LPR. Nothing else is added into that database. That's just that screening for those uh, carriers that are subject to a federal out of service order. Um, Colonel, what is uh, NCIC? I'm sorry, uh, National Crime Information Center. So you don't take pictures of any automobile plates? It, well, the, the system will take a snapshot of the plate, sir, but it's we don't retain historical data on it. Our, uh, we're screening just against the commercial plates. So when we go by a tractor trailer, it's grabbing the, um, the number of that plate and running against that database for an out-of-service vehicle and alert us to that. But the plate itself, after two hours, is deleted right from the computer the way we have it set up. So if you look at the statutory language, it does allow for the retention of historical data for up to 18 months with the, from day one to the first six months, agencies can, um, DMV can search our data and agencies that used to have LPRs can request the police to search the data as well. And then from six months to 18 months, you actually needed a search warrant to review the data. Um, and then after the 18th month, the uh, plate reads were uh, uh, wiped from the DPS system or DMV system. Um, in our case, we're not even retaining historical data. We're doing a daily update to our LPRs for the federal database for the commercial vehicles. And after two hours, that plate read is removed from the laptop. So you do, one of the circumstances where you uh, might take a picture of an automobile license plate, where, where and when? Well, the system will, will take pictures of all license plates, sir. Where does it do that? It, the camera takes the, the No, I know. In what place? Uh, along, along the interstate? I mean, I'm at the borders? Where, where does this happen? So we have 17 LPRs that are mounted on our pickup trucks, those marked pickup trucks that we operate. Each of them has a mobile system, a three camera system. So if those inspectors are on mobile patrol going down the highway, it's scanning plates. And again, our focus is on the commercial motor vehicle. So we, even if it takes a car plate, it's not gonna hit against anything to give us an alert. And again, those plate reads are actually removed after two hours. Um, the com again, we're screening against the commercial. So mobile patrol, if we're sitting in a U-turn, um, as part of our scanning of the commercial vehicles, or when you see us like at the Colchester Way Station where we're operating there, we have one of our cruisers set up at the, at the approach at the beginning of the detail, scanning the plates to alert the officers whether or not we have a truck that's under the federal out of service order. Okay, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm still not um, uh, understanding when one of these trucks might take the picture of the license plate that's on a car, if, if, it's, if you're not interested in that at all, why don't they only take pictures of plates on the non trucks? So this is Commissioner Manoli yeah. and, um, and Jake, I'm gonna, I, the system is in the vehicle, so it's automated. So uh, as I think what, it, it will take that plate picture. And what the colonel is saying is that with the way the system is set up, the pleasure vehicle, the data isn't capped. It's erased after two hours. And that the focus um, is on the commercial vehicle. Is that correct, Jake? That is correct. So that when they turn the system on, um, Chair McCormick, it is, it is activated. Um, but the DMV enforcement side is not doing anything, as the Colonel said, with what I call pleasure vehicle or standard truck um, data. Their focus is on the commercial side. So this camera somehow knows what a license plate is and it takes a picture of all license plates. It does, it picture, it just, it's, it, it's an optical character recognition is what the camera does. Okay. The OCR basically recognizes, but it, it 
there have been times where I've seen it pick up a picket fence and say one, 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 one as well. So, <laughs> it, uh, I mean, but that's part of the training the officer is to look at the plate and recognize if it's a good or a bad plate or if it's a picket fence that ignore it as well. Yep. Okay, very good. Um, I've got um, Representative Burke. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the other issue is that the, I believe, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that the state police and other law enforcement agencies use this also for different purposes. Like when, when we did this bill, it was about, you know, perhaps, you know, some kind of um, looking for children or some kind of abduction or, or some kind of a crime. And that's why, and, but we did put the, the limitation of the 18 months on it because uh, people were concerned about that kind of information staying there permanently. So I don't know if anybody else who's on the committee, maybe Mike wants to talk about that as well. Okay. Um, yes, Representative Potter. Yeah, in uh, agreement with what, what Molly said, uh, I remember distinctly the representative from the state police and uh, the Civil Liberties Union representative uh, met outside the committee, and they're the ones that formulated this compromise of 18 months and uh, how the data was going to be stored and so forth. And so, what was it, two years ago or more? It was more than two years ago, I think. Uh, there was agreement about how to do this in a compromising way by two, two groups, the state police and the civil liberties union that you would never think would be able to come to agreement, but they did. And uh, I think we're just sort of being asked to extend this. At the same time though, I'd be interested in probably Jake or uh, the commissioner would know <clears throat> It seems like there's a lot less uh, participation by law enforcement in this endeavor than there was when we made this agreement a while back. In fact, I think I heard somebody say today there was only one, one group reporting historical data to the, uh, to the re repository of that data. So maybe uh, Jake or the commissioner can inform us a little bit more about how, uh, how, how this is being used compared to what it was when we set this up. I'm gonna let the Colonel answer that because he has a, a, a pretty good understanding of what's occurring statewide. So at this time, DMV is the only agency that's running a ALPRs. Um, Vermont State Police has removed all of their units, um, as uh, most all other agencies. The only uh, agency in the last reporting period um, that Vermont State Police had was the Essex County Sheriff. And my understanding is, as of at this point in time, my understanding is he's even uh, ceased using the system. So right now, the only state, any law enforcement agency in the state of Vermont, the only agency currently using LPRs is DMV and at, under the narrow scope of our operation. Um, the problem, uh, the reason my understanding uh, to a certain point was that the system and the manufacturer that the state police and the other law enforcement agencies are using, um, most of their equipment is aged out and it's very, was very expensive for them to replace it and uh, and kind of budgeting with other things that those agencies needed to purchase. Um, there had been some discussions from law enforcement about just doing it at fixed site locations versus a mobile application. But I think right now cost is what's to a certain point the issue for those agencies of getting it. And then there was just some of the concerns um, just with the process that the other vendor really wasn't able to kind of tailor the system to answer some of those reporting questions that are um, were required as part of the report out with the, the current legislation. 
Um, so that's why I think you've basically seen most law enforcement sunset. Again, for us, it's a very limited scope and it just makes our inspectors more effective at screening. Uh, and again, we're just looking at the motor carrier population. We aren't even looking at passenger cars. We don't load any other data other than that PRISM file that screens the commercial trucks. Well, thank you, Jake. I think, uh, I think, you know, what we just heard from you makes our decision making fairly simple, really. Uh, it's, it, it sounds like from your testimony that cost is pretty much shelved to the previous effort that was going on with regard to this. So all we're, as I understand it from what you say, all we really have to decide is what we're hearing from you around motor vehicles, uh, commercial trucks, which is really pretty limiting, I think, and not threatening in my viewpoint. Thank you for that testimony. You're welcome. Okay. Representative Murphy and then Burke. I'm sorry, I don't, don't have my hand up. <laughs> yeah, McCarthy. <laughs> These Irish names, you know, they can get confused. Um, so I know that um, my police department in the city of St. Albans has been using ALPR in very limited scope to do some zone parking enforcement as a test in the last few months. And so they wouldn't have been reporting data up to public safety. So I'm wondering, Colonel, or if, if anybody else knows, if there are still agencies that like DMB are using ALPR for screening, but aren't retaining the data beyond you know, a very short window. So they don't really fall into the enforcement of this particular statute. So the current language, the way it is, uh, Representative McCarthy, is specific to law enforcement and law enforcement usage of LPR data. So my understanding with St. Albans um, it is very separate and distinct that the data they're using is for parking enforcement, screening for parking enforcement, and that the data is not available for law enforcement. It, it's a civil capacity and doesn't fall under the language of or fall under the law enforcement access and criteria. And so it's separated in that regard. Um, one of the other things that had, did come up when we were looking historically at, with LPRs is that it does not pre prevent private usage. So one of the things is the industry came in and uh, an industry uh, lobbyist or representative came in from Washington DC to the House Judiciary Committee and talked about that it's used for parking enforcement, like parking structures, tracking vehicles that way. Um, you have companies like uh, that repo repossess cars, uh, towing operations that will use it, but those are all in a civil capacity and are outside of law enforcement purview and access. Um, so you, you, you could have private entities or like this, uh, a municipality that is is doing it for their parking enforcement, but it doesn't come under the current language. And we wouldn't, if they were to share it, then that type of information then would have to be reported based on the current language you have in front of you that's in Title 23. Okay, Mike, Representative Burke. So I was just wondering though, I mean, based on this information, do we want to keep this 18, 18 month provision or do we want to shorten that provision? I don't know. Maybe it's just too much to get into right now in this situation. We would have to take testimony probably from police and et cetera. Just raising the question. Yes, and it's a good question. And um, I have similar questions about the, the TNC. Um, so we, we will have that DMV bill eventually. Um, and uh, would all three of these be germane to that? I think, I think so. Um, uh, yeah. When you think so, Anthea? Yep. So, uh, yes. So I think we do have that opportunity. Why don't we um, take all three uh, and see what we think if we're ready to dispose of any of them um, today uh, and otherwise I think we can wait um, 
and um, and we could work on them and you know be uh, before we have the DMV, but well, that would be our our way to do something about it, I believe. Okay, you know, an amendment to that bill, and you know, we probably will have others. Um, so, anything else for our witnesses? Yes, sure. uh, Representative Murphy. I just was going to say. Um... Oh, I guess it's irrelevant. DMV bill is out of committee as well. So they wouldn't, I just was going to ask if potentially they'd be making the adjustments in the Senate and whether we could at least speak to um, Senate transportation and, and make that suggestion so that um, when they pass the bill to us, maybe these changes have been made and we can just agree with them. Yeah. Um, uh, why don't I call, I have actually have not talked to um, Senator Mazza um, in a while, you know, Two or three weeks now, so um, I'm hearing that they haven't met. Anthea, have they met um, the Senate Transportation Committee? Senate Transportation has not met since the first week um, that you were out of the State House. Yeah. Um, and then, as for the miscellaneous motor vehicle bill, the Department of Motor Vehicles has proposed their version of must pass, which I walked through. Um, yep. It feels like months ago, but I think it was a little over a month ago. Um, so what it, it could be that what ends up getting passed out of the Senate is more expansive than what people view as a, a must pass a version of something. But I think dealing with sunsets, if you want to deal with them, would certainly need to be must pass because something is going to happen on July 1 of 2020. Yeah. Inaction is action in, in this case. Um, so yes, I, that, that's a possibility. Yeah. Um, well, I guess what I want to say is that don't feel you have to dispose of each one of these uh, today. Well, I, we that. I, I would also just um, kind of jumping off of what Anthea just said, whether we want to craft a bill, you know, use one of the bills that are on our wall or that have gone through the house somehow to put these pieces on and just pass as a completely separate, this action has to happen Um, I'm sorry, would you say that again? Well, just looking at if we want to, instead of trying to add these to a bill, if, if it looks like the DMV bill may not get acted on, we've had a year in the past where everything got put into one bill and that's all that happened. Yeah. And whether we want to take action considering that, and even as we rewrite T-bill, include it in a must-pass COVID-19 transportation bill. Uh, yeah, my guess is that the speaker would not care for that way because as I, as I told you what she said about the T-bill, uh, she doesn't want it recommitted to us. She wants to, she wants, she, she is just trying to minimize the procedural steps. I mean, I think right. in everything that, that we're doing. Uh, Representative McCoy. If you wanted to do that, I think the speaker's preference would be to have it a committee bill and use a, a committee bill. Don't take a, a number that's on the wall right now. I think that's the cleanest way that she would agree to. I, I, I don't know if I agree, but um, you know, we'll, we'll ask her. Again, I, I think all she's focused on, uh, on, on all these bills from all the committees uh, that are not directly COVID related are um, uh, minimizing the steps. Uh, you know, I guess because just everything takes so long, maybe is the main reason, I don't know. Um, it, it does, it takes forever. Yeah. So that's why she didn't, I think the, the cleanest way would be a committee bill, unless you're, because these are must passes, or if they are, if we, I mean, we can just do nothing and something happens as Kurt said, but if we wanna do something, they're, they are they are, they would be considered a must pass bill. All right. Well, let's um, uh, let's see how we do feel about the three. Um, Commissioner, have you told us everything you want to tell us? And Neil and Anthea, is there anything that you wanted to add that you think we are missing about about uh, any one of these three? Sunsets. So this is Commissioner Manoli, and um, I'm. I feel that I hope we've answered all of your questions. I think we have. 
there's nothing more that I would um, add at this time. I think the Colonel has responded um, you know, to your questions and provided a good overview. I do have Mike Smith, who's also listening in. And if I could just, Mike, is there anything that we missed that you would add um, or concerns? This is Mike Smith. And no, I think that uh, you've done a wonderful job covering everything needed. So we are good, Chair McCormick. Well, well, thank you, Commissioner. And I think your testimony it always is very clear. Uh, and that's, that's very helpful and, uh, and, and thorough. All right, so let's, um, I just happen to have, um, this last one we spoke about, Commissioner kind of did it in the opposite order that I had written them down. Um, the, uh, the cameras and that, those initials, what are those initials, AP something? Uh, ALPR. A-L-P-R. Yep. Um, all right. Uh, on that one, um, what does the committee think? We should extend it. Okay, extend it. Um, the two years that was a, a, um, recommended by DNV? Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm hearing a lot of yups. Uh, yes. this, this will just be a straw poll, uh, but but is there a motion for this to, for just a straw poll vote on that question? And that question would be: um, Do we uh, extend the um, sunset in the ALPR law by two years? So it'd be the same thing as it is now, only the date changes up two years. I would make that motion. Okay. Second it. Okay. Any discussion? Right. And I guess my only concern would be, do we need to hear more testimony from the ALCU, uh, you know, to get their perspective? You know, we're hearing one side of the, the story, but should we be balancing our approach to say, hey, we reached out to the people that originally had concerns with this language, you know, a couple of years ago uh, to do our due diligence or no? Uh, I have you, Anthea. Just, um, so um, Anthea sent us the testimony uh, of Senate uh, Judiciary. Uh, the hearing was probably about two weeks ago now, and, and I, have, I was actually tuned into it and heard it then as well. Um, and they testified, ACLU testified there on this question. So, but now, Anthea. Uh, so the ACLU testified at the border crossing issue. Oh, in you're right. Uh, on Tuesday in House Judiciary, they took up this sunset and they're planning on hearing from the ACLU on this exact issue. So then they should deal with it then. I don't mean, what are we, what are we taking it up? I mean, if yeah, we're taking well, testimony, why are we doing it? Because they originally had it before, right? Or at least a, a version of it. Didn't they sort of take it over at we, the house, you know, our, our committee really originally passed it years ago and then they sort of took the lead on it or am I remembering that wrong? No, and I think that Tim, you've got it right too. That kind of answers that question, Kurt, about where we would even put this action if we just let judiciary take take the front lead. But um, we're hearing about it because it's Title 23 and we had asked to be informed and alert to anything that was affecting the title that we, to some extent, hold responsibility for. I think it's just a, it's an overlap. We both have jurisdiction. Uh, on this. Yeah. So it would be on their part. So we're just concurring I mean, uh, so I guess we'd have to wait to see what the judiciary does, and then we would occur with the language that they may or may not come up with. Right, since they're not, they haven't had this hearing yet. We don't know what. Um, yeah. And since um, the last thing, the last difficulty with uh, overlap with with those guys, they've been keeping in touch with me. Um, so um, uh, and. Um, and frankly, I had not realized that, that that issue was in the Senate bill as it came over. I had actually thought it was the House Judiciary. It wasn't. Yeah, it was not. Yeah, it was in the Senate. So uh, I don't know, Tim, it sounds like maybe you have a, a substitute uh, motion, which is that we hold off on this vote. Well, it's not really a substitute motion. I'm just trying to figure out what we're doing because it sounds like is, this is going to this part is going to be in, in judiciary's bill or you know, are they doing an ominous bill? It sounds like they're going to do it and then we're just going to 
you know, get up like we did on the uh, uh, other part where the judiciary did. We concurred with them yanking it out. Is that going to be the same game plan? Or is this going into our DMV bill? The answer is it could be. So I guess we should wait and see what we're doing here. That's why I'm saying. Would be my my take, but. Or or maybe at least, Kurt, in your conversation with um, uh, Representative Grodd, you could just let her know the committee's intent on it or, or, you know, support position and leave it at that. As they're looking at more testimony, they could just hear what our recommendation is. Okay. We don't need to be terribly formal here, but um, well, to be a little formal, I'm hearing that Barbara is not withdrawing her motion, and Tim, you are not doing a substitute of motion, right? motion. So that motion is still on the floor. Okay, Tim, you understand? Yeah. Okay. I've got a couple of hands up. Uh, Mary, and then Patty. Oh. <laughs> no, just, just Patty. Well, in that same vein, um, if, if judiciary is taking up this one, do we know whether commerce is taking up the transportation driver network one? Because they're the ones that originally had the bill three years ago. Do we know if um, Mike Marcotte is dealing with this? Perhaps we should just reach out to see. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that committee is or not. Anthea, do you know? I don't know. I'm you sorry. Wouldn't, you wouldn't be involved with that one over there. My guess is that they aren't, but because I haven't heard that they are, Patty, but I will definitely um, um, today. Okay, so I think we still want to kind of pitch it. Oh, um, Representative Burke. Yeah, I, I think maybe, I mean, it sounds like we should do this, but I have this, I would just like to hear what the ACLU had to say at this point in time. Uh, before making a final decision about this. Okay, so you want to hold off. Again, you, you have a substitute for uh, Barbara's motion. Yes or no? Yeah. Okay. All right, and that is we just hold off on this. I mean, I'm inclined to support it, but I, but hearing that they, I, and I thought, well, we just, you know, do we have time to start hearing, given the fact that they are going to be hearing from the ACLU that's already scheduled, then I would like to just, wait and see what they have to say. Okay. I think the commissioner had her hand up. Yeah. Uh, oh, Kurt. Yeah. I'm, okay, uh, yes, commissioner. Manoli. Yeah, it always takes me a few minutes to <clears throat> find that speaker button. When you're done this discussion, I was trying to send you all a text. Um, I would like, <clears throat> because you are talking about must haves, um, we do have a new item that is on our list to talk to you about. We have not spoken to the Senate about this yet. Um, so if you have time today, if we could take a few moments to discuss this with you, we would appreciate it once you're done. We're, we're actually out of time already. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so, so next time, maybe you could write to us, tell us what it's about. Yeah, I'm, and uh, so we will send you a communication and send it to Anthea. We are we are moving towards driver permits online and we need to have some language amended so we can do this for an extended period of time Okay. with our proposal. So we will put something in writing um, and get it to you, okay? Very good, next, but next week is okay to talk about it? Yeah, we'll get something to you before next week and then we can talk about it. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Um, okay, so, okay, so are we, let's have a show of hands. Um, again, we have a substitute motion, Molly, that's the question now. And, and it's simply to hold off on Barbara's motion until we hear, so we can get to hear the testimony. And by the way, you can tune into that too, if you want to. So, so we're taking my motion off. We're not going to do my vote. If, if, um, well, we have a vote on that again. I mean, it's straw poll. But okay, you, you know, withdraw. Okay, thank you. <laughs> is that what no, you said? I was saying I, I oh. would like a straw poll. Yeah, okay. Because I think that the ACLU is going to testify to, to judiciary, and you know, we're giving our recommendation based on the DMV, and I just would be curious of the committee what that voice, whether we agree with that or whether we want to hold off, because I think we could take this off our table and let judiciary own it. 
Okay, I'm seeing Mike nod his head in agreement, I think. Yeah, I mean, frankly, the, the ACLU is going to want us to at least keep this in place. Like, that would be right. the, the sort yeah. of minimum okay. that, they, that they would be in favor of based on all the experience we had from the last few goes yeah. and go-arounds with this topic. Okay. okay. I'm fine. Here. I'm fine with that. I'm very good. I okay. can, I can concur. Okay. Very good. Show of hands. Who agrees with uh, Barbara's motion? And I think it's everybody. Anybody disagree? Any no's? Okay. Very good. Unanimous. Thank you. Um, let's just try to at least do something with all three of these. The next one I have is the TNC. I, I would make a motion that um, we do a straw poll on how we feel on the DMV position, but also as with the other, have you communicate with the Chair of Commerce that would they be interested in doing this in a must pass bill? Because it is something they've dealt with. Okay, Commerce Committee. And also, um, I put a call in to the um, City Council uh, Transportation Committee and haven't heard back yet. And they, uh, I spoke to the chair who was not, uh, actually the former chair, now the president of the board, Max Tracy. Uh, he was not familiar with the state law at the time. So um, I, I would like to talk to him also, or you know, to, to the city and see um, if they do feel the way uh, everybody seems to think they're going to feel, that they're going to want it extended also. But um, uh, so there's two things I've got to do. So um, let's see. Um, so Barbara, what you you just want to know again how we feel about the? Well, my motion, if we're being that formal informally, is that we support the DMV position and have a straw poll on that as committee. And then that answer gets given to the Commerce Committee. Okay. I guess personally representing Burlington, I, I would like to talk to the city first. And, and I think, am I right with the DMV position being that we extend, we continue the, the, the sunset, we throw it out another couple of years. Yep, two years. So we allow Burlington to still operate as they have. Yep. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if you can answer that. I mean, I think the whole thing from my perspective is it wasn't in our committee. We never had it. What was the expectation when this deal was met? Uh, did they anticipate it that it would, would go away or uh, did they think it would be codified? You know, what, I mean, I can't vote on what, you know, one side of a, party said because we were never really originally part of this conversation it wasn't our bill so i don't know what we're voting on without well, hearing from the other parties that's kind of the same argument molly had for the other though that we're just saying we support the agency position and and are allowing that committee to then move forward with it it being as you say something their committee has all the testimony on but i don't know if i can support it because of that agreement I mean, I wouldn't support something that where there was an agreement when this, uh, you know, the language came into place, uh, you know, two years ago, if there was an agreement, like, sorry, this was going to get abolished, you're going to abide by, you know, we're going to give you two years to incorporate what the rest of the state has to do. Uh, I mean, like I said, it may or may not have went down that way, but if it did go down that way, I wouldn't support DMV's position. You see what I'm saying? I do, and I'd, I'd be in that same seat if it meant Burlington had to be stricter than they're being in order to step yeah. up to state law. But what we're saying is they can't be as strict and as cautious as they've chosen. They have, they'd have to reduce what they're requesting. So that, that's why I am taking an assumption that I feel is pretty safe, that Burlington would at least want it extended. Yeah. Well, I'm sure they would, but how about Uber or the, the companies that have those that are paying, you know, was, was, I mean, I don't know. There's just more to the conversation. Patty? Then I'm sure they have an association, don't they? I, my suggestion is to, if you just give a quick call to Mike Marcotte, because he's going to remember all of this, trust me. He'll remember yeah. what Burlington's, uh, at, so that's what I would suggest. I mean, we can take the straw poll now based on 
you know, just hearing what we hear, yeah, extended two years based on what you get from Mike Markov. But and uh, I guess my concerns about what, what we've heard today is not so much whether or not the sunset should go out on this on this particular sunset, but rather um, the situation that you know the scenario we ran on um, uh, Rebecca Rebecca's um, uh, district, and that's uh, to make sure that we have good law, we have the right law at the time. Because it sounds like we might not. I don't know. Mary, did you have your hand up? Um, I did, and basically it was just kind of adding to it, but I mean, I'd be comfortable with either two years of codifying. Um, you know, they, they do add um, greater protections for Burlington as they've seen fit. Um, but in the meantime, it wouldn't be a bad idea to get in touch with the city councilor and find out, you know, I assume that the council is supportive of their own ordinance. So. Yeah, and of course, it doesn't sound like Mary or I have heard from the city that they wanted a change in this. No. Right, Mary? Yeah, I, I haven't. So you would think that we would if they wanted a change in the law. But maybe Burlington's fine, but maybe the rest of the state isn't. I don't know. I, I also have not heard from someone, Timmy, you asked if there's an organization. They, they probably do have formed an association, but I'm not familiar with it if they have. Again, if they have, they have not been in touch. Nobody from Uber or Lyft. I don't think it's been in touch on this. No, no, I'm thinking the scooter people have. <laughs> Athena has a, a, an answer to that. Yeah. Um, I will point out that when you are a host, you cannot raise your hand, which is sort of frustrating. <laughs> so hey. Uber and Lyft do have lobbyists. Um, you could reach out to them. And then I think Uber and Lyft could also probably, maybe not their lobbyists, but someone from Uber and Lyft could answer what Representative White raised with the, the border issue. Um, yep. Dylan Zwicky is, I believe, has Lyft as one of his clientele. And I think Chris Rice has Uber. Yes. OK. Uh, and Patty, is that what you wanted to say? Uh, wh what I wanted to say was uh, perhaps they've already reached out to Commerce and we don't know it because this whole bill went through Commerce. Yeah. So my suggestion would be to reach out to Mike Marka. Yeah. So, uh, Barbara, can we- And I'm not sure on? this is a, I, I know it deals with vehicles, but it's a Commerce issue because it's a company. Lyft and Uber are companies which go through Commerce. So that's why I just keep going back to what commerce deal. Yeah. No, and I agree, but I, I do think that there's a legitimate overlap here. Overlaps exist, you know, they're, they're not I'm all- I'm surprised you didn't hear it two years ago or three, it has to be, well, four years ago, four or three, three or four years ago, this went through, so. Yeah, it, it doesn't, Timmy, uh, Maybe Mike, Barbara, and uh, Molly, and Dave. You guys remember, and and also Connie. Anybody remember this a discussion about this? And in... no, no, no. no the, there was no discussion that I remember either about it. No, and I I would be very happy to amend my motion of straw poll that it simply be we we pass it to commerce. <laughs> Um, well, but again, there's still, I, it's, there's still, it's transportation, you know? It is, and, and, I, and again, I go back, we wanted to see things that affect Title 23, but I don't know that it means we always have to stick our thumb in the pie. Yeah. We just want to know what's happening. Yeah, well, Barbara, can we, can we hold off on this one then? Of course, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. It can wait. And I, I really, really will stay on these things so that next time we meet, uh, and it might even be just a, an email to everybody, um, what I learned, I'll, I will do that. Okay, then the third one, I'll, um, Lori, is it okay if we go on for a few more minutes here? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, the mail carriers, maybe we can dispose of that one. <laughs> I'm fine with it. <laughs> I say make it codified law. I'm I fine. Agree. I agree. Okay. I shouldn't give my opinion yet. Okay. Anybody disagree with what Barbara just said? Okay, I'm going to take that as unanimous support for removing the uh, sunset and codifying that section of law. 
Uh, and I think that does require us to take action because I'm not sure anyone else will unless it would be GovOps. Yep. Yeah, maybe, maybe this one we can do all by ourselves. Yeah. All right, very good. Isn't that amazing? I, I really thought we'd have trouble meeting for an hour and a half today. Instead, we had our longest hearing, went over the longest. Uh, you can never tell, can you, the legislature? Uh, Brian's gone off. No, it's, he's just, uh, okay. Anthea was Anthea physically raising. Oh, yes, Anthea. Hi. Um, so what I will do is I will um, put into the current draft of the must-pass miscellaneous motor vehicle bill a section that would repeal the sunset. So it'll just sort of continue to be codified law. Is that the plan? Yes. Yes. Okay. TNC, I'm going to get back to everybody on. And the ALPR, we did vote. Clerk, did, did you notice what exactly we did on that? Clerk White? <laughs> I didn't clerk anything. I, <laughs> no, I, I Last time I asked about this, people said, don't even try. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm mostly kidding. Uh, how, how about um, Anthea, what, what exactly did we do? Are we doing that? Well, Barbara, it was your um, uh, motion. I think that we sent that one off to judiciary, knowing that they'd be hearing from ACLU and that we would just give them our support of the position from DMV, but they'll be hearing more. Yes, that's right. We are taking that position though. So we are agreeing with DMV on that. Yeah, that's another two year extension of the sunset. Correct. Very good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Oh, and um, uh, please uh, email me now with on the on my ledge account. I'm trying to do that, like I know I should have always been doing. So, uh, if you can, since obviously communications between us are legislative, um, so yes. please uh, contact me that way. Okay. It's not the end of the world if you still use my Gmail. It's just uh, I'm trying to, to get out of it, kind of trying to separate them now. I'm proud of you, Kurt. <laughs> you have a hand up. What was that, Laurie? Representative oh. White has her hand up. Oh, oh, sorry. Representative White. Sorry. Uh, when are we meeting next week? I, I'm assuming, well, you know what? I don't know because we, I thought we were going to stick to the schedule we had in the past, but this week was different. And you know why? Because we're on the floor more now. So, and uh, I believe, Kurt, we're going to be on the floor next Wednesday at, okay. at 10 or have an all house caucus. It's 10 in one, similar to what we did this week. I think Mitzi wants to stay with that schedule. And so, then Friday at 10. And Friday at 10. But yeah, what we're doing this week, she wants to keep that for house floor or caucus. Schedule wise. Yes. Very good. I didn't know that. Okay. So, um, I'm going to put in for a little more time, okay, for, if I can get it next week. So, um, Becca, I'll let you know as soon as I know. Okay. okay so, I, I should I? People need to know what to plan. Is there a day of the week that I should block off? I, I don't want to say yet. Maybe okay. later on today I can say. Okay. That would be fabulous. Yeah. yeah. I'll call you as soon as we have it and I'll email everybody. Thank you, Kurt. Okay. Thank you, everybody. It's actually a good hearing.